My first car was a 1965 Morris Mini Deluxe. I purchased at 15 years old. It was an utter piece of crap. It spent about four and a half years restoring it with my dad into an award-winning Mini. Despite all the money I spent on it and the work we put into it, it seemed every month there was always something which had to be fixed. So I never really had the confidence to take it very far. But it was loads of fun around town, especially around corners. My love of the outdoors eventually drove me to begin looking for a four-wheel drive. I think it was the legendary Bush Tucker man, Les Hiddens, which put the idea in my mind in the late 80s and early 90s that the car I should own would be a Land Rover Defender. So searching online for weeks, I found it. It was the one. Mainly because it was the only one I could afford at $13,000 for a 1993 110. It was my ticket to adventure, my first four-wheel drive. Now, at that point in my life, I'd just finished my degree one and a half years earlier and had spent one and a half years trying to get a job as a park ranger. I'd sent out over 24 applications throughout Queensland without success, only getting two interviews and everyone saying that I needed more experience, that catch-22 situation. It seems, though, that the universe was on my side. As only three weeks after buying my Defender, I got a phone call from the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service offering me a four-month temporary position on Cape York at Lakefield National Park. Now, this was not from any of the positions that I had actually applied for, just a recommendation from one of my previous applications. And so now, with the four-wheel drive, I said yes to the position and that I'd be ready to start in three weeks. And thus began the mad scramble, preparing my truck mechanically and many trips to ARB and TJM to purchase all the accessories and recovery gear. Now, three long days of driving north, passing cans, I make it to the town of Lakeland on Cape York. A few hundred metres beyond then, I hit my first gravel road. What better place to learn how to four-wheel drive for the first time ever in a car I had only owned for six weeks than on Cape York. So I learned very fast. And later discovered when I hit the corrugated track headed into Lakefield that my, all my shocks were stuffed and my backhand started bouncing around on the, on, the, on the roads and all the gauges began rattling out of my dash and the noise was absolutely deafening. But my time on Cape York was wonderful for me. Although I did also find by the time I reached Lakefield that the fuel tank had rusted out between the bash plate and so now had a fuel leak to uh, solve as well. Thankfully those mechanical skills gained from four and a half years restoring a Mini were going to come in handy. My first week they had me on the back of an ATV with a flamethrower lighting up kilometres of bushland for, as part of their annual burn program. There are crocodiles and wild bulls plenty of snakes, pigs and vast distances without people. I never knew what was going to be around the next corner. It could be a rolled over four wheel drive, a cow van broken down with a broken axle, the latest roadkill or a crocodile crossing the road. That four month position was eventually turning into one and a half years with my temporary position continuing to be extended until I got a position as a full-time ranger at Iron Range. But after two years of living on Cape York, I had still not seen everything. So there's a parks joke. It goes, where does a park ranger go to get away from it all? Well, in June 2008, I took three weeks holidays and travelled from Cairns to the tip of Cape York solo. Starting at Daintree National Park, the wet tropics, I explored the flowing creeks which were like veins throughout the rainforest with trees covered in creepers and vines along with multiple creek crossings. I later passed through Lakefield 
heading across the crocodile infested cow power crossing into Cape Melville National Park. After hours of driving and some deep water crossings, I arrived at the stunning beach with golden sands. The place was virtually untouched by man. There were mangroves along the creeks. The waters were crystal clear, filled with fish and yabbies you could see creeping along the bottom. It was silence and stillness. So I set up my swag, and later that night, I lay in bed looking out at the stars, worried about every sound I could hear around me. Because only one to two years before, a crocodile had come up the banks where I was and had grabbed a man out of his tent and tried to drag him back to the water. That was when the grandmother came out of her tent and jumped on the back of this croc and was bashing it, trying to save it. They eventually ended up shooting the croc, I believe. So there I was there, lying at night. I had a big Rambo hunting knife right next to my hand, which is where I slept every night when I was traveling during my three weeks. Heading on to Lakefield National Park, I passed Red Lily Lagoon with the massive red lotus lilies, and then later, Nifold Plains, vast open grassland with thousands of two to three meter tall magnetic termite mounds. Onwards to Jardine River National Park and the beginning of the Overland Telegraph Track. This had a fairly rough track into Gunshot Creek, which thankfully this time was fairly easy, so I just went straight down and through. By that point I'd done about 1,500 kilometres. Soon up came Cockatoo Creek. With its deep potholes, I went straight through and bounced around. I had quite a few onlookers who ended up deciding to turn back and take the detour. Finally, I make it to Twin Falls, where I wedged myself up against a waterfall and allowed the pummeling water to massage my neck and ease my worries. Until a tour bus showed up with a bunch of old men and women in budgie smugglers and kind of destroyed my, my privacy and beautiful <laughs> spot I had to myself. After a few days, I continued on to Nolan's Brook, which is one of the deepest crossings on Cape York. And I decided to go straight in through. My nose dived under. I came up halfway through and then got bogged. So thankfully this time I had a fellow there, he gave me a quick tug out and I continued on, which gave me a good chance to open my doors and allow all the water to flow out and the red dust to get washed out at, the, at that point in time. Crossing over the Jardine River on the ferry, I started exploring the various World War II aircrafts, crashes and fuel dumps. Later camping in Seisha, and by the next morning, I headed up to the tip, scrambling up the rocky mountains and hills, down to the water's edge, and I stood next to that sign at the tip of Cape York. You were standing at the northernmost point of the Australian continent. It was an incredible accomplishment for me doing it solo, and to think I passed endless convoys of multiple trucks and heavily modified vehicles and I was doing it solo in a stock defender with a snorkel. So after two years and five months living on Cape York, working as a park ranger, it was time for me to move on. As another wet season was approaching and the isolation and lack of social life was starting to affect me. Like my first day on Cape York with my stuffed shocks and fuel tank, my last day saw my front diff fail just short of Lakeland. I got a tray into Cooktown and eventually a bus back to Cairns and waited a week for repairs. Now, it has always been a dream of mine to complete the big lap. Every year I kept thinking, maybe next year, maybe next year. But of course, it never came. While listening to a Tony Robbins program, Personal Power 2, he talked about the importance of setting a date picking that goal and working towards it, taking immediate action. So it was then I decided and picked a date two years in advance, January 2014. Now three days after Christmas in 2011, I began stripping out my Defender Bear so I could convert it into a camper I could comfortably live in for one year. I spent most weekends and nights either working on the car or reading forums, looking for ideas, comparing options and costs. Well, after two years, 
I was nowhere near ready. So pushed it out another year. About $25,000 later, it was complete. I had a new gearbox and transfer case, upgraded rear diff and axles, new shocks, springs and bushes, new fuel tank, intercooler and turbo, HF and UHF radios, and loads of new gauges and dash upgrades, along with many others. My solo remote area touring vehicle was ready. Three years of work and planning had paid off and I no longer had any excuses why I couldn't go. So I wrote out my application for a 12 month career break and handed it into work. And on the 9th of February 2015, I set off on the first day of 10 month trip around Australia. It took nearly three months for m before my mind began to unwind and accepted the new lifestyle where I was no longer having to be or do or achieve anything. <coughs> True freedom, where I could choose at every moment what I wanted to do. My decision to head south was somewhat spontaneous, but ended up me traveling opposite to the masses. The further south I went, the colder it got and the more empty the national parks were, giving me the best choices of every campsite. As well as plenty of quiet solitude, just to sit and listen to nature or read a book. But one of my highlights of my 10 month trip was Googs Track in South Australia, 363 dunes ahead of me, a vast expanse of Mallee covered desert, dry, hot, isolated, no water in sight. This was what lay ahead of me, 120 kilometres of sand driving and flies. After a couple hours driving, a loud, a, la a loud rattle sound and a very foul smell filled the cabin. So I quickly hit the brakes and shut the engine off. I look underneath, I discovered that my muffler had disconnected from my turbocharger outlet. So I was filling the cabin with exhaust fumes. I discovered I was missing two bolts. So I searched through my parts box and pulled out the fencing wire. And after 30 minutes, I had the muffler strapped up again and hit the road. To about 500 meters later, when a foul smell filled the cabin. So I stopped again in a few more wraps of wire and I was back on the track. Up and down dunes, up and down dunes. I reached the first highlight along the track, which was a memorial to Gook and Dinger, the father and son who forged the track in the 1970s. A lazy drive beyond Googs, gleaming lake white surface, was where I camped for the next two days. Now the lake's white because it's a saltwater lake. It stays dry most, most of the year and there's a thin white layer of salt across all the surface. Departing the lake, my dune cresting continued to a large mass sprouted from the horizon, Mount Fink, the next highlight along the Googs, an oasis abundant with birds, lizards and wallabies who come there to drink the water which collects in all the gullies and crevices from the shade of the mountain. Early next morning, I began my ascent to the summit. Now there's no tracks out here. You just scramble your way up the hillside through the clumps of spinifex. I left my mark in the time capsule at the top, if you're ever there. Totally worth it, I wrote. The view was eternal. Nothing but Mali desert till beyond the horizon. A farewelling Mount Fink. I jumped in my Defender once more and churned up the red desert sands till I turned a corner and came out to the Trans-Australian Railway Line, the end of the Googs track, with 363 dunes behind me. Now near the end of my trip, I was on the border of the Northern Territory in Western Australia. I was sweltering at sunrise from the wet season build up storms. By that point, it was late November, I think. It was time for me to head home. And with three solid days of driving, I arrived in Mount Isa finding my way back to Brisbane. Towards the end of my trip, 
I felt truly alive, like never, ever before. My mind was endlessly filled with ideas. I'd read over 80 books on entrepreneurship and business and personal development. I'd, I'd felt incredible compared to the normal feeling of that numbness that typically I'd feel when I was at work every day. But within one, th one month from returning home, that spirit inside began to fade. And within a few short months back at work, which had stood still and was still the same old work I'd left over a year beforehand, I was back to feeling unfulfilled again. Now I had originally planned after returning to buy a house and settle down. But after doing the maths, I realised I would be a slave for the next 30 to 40 years trying to live off $400 a week after, report, after mortgage repayments. So it wasn't long before I decided that I'd start preparing to hit the road again. For the last year, I've been prepping my car with new mods and learning from my 2015 trip how to improve my vehicle for long-term living and reliability. So in preparation for 2018, my extra mods have been a complete engine rebuild top to bottom with a new crankshaft as I had a stuffed crankshaft keyway which was a bit of a reliability issue for really remote area travel. I also have minor additions of new gauges, a Raptor binnacle to stop the bouncing dash and the rattles, as well as a nice new mattress and a fancy camp oven and additional solar panels. So some of the repairs and problems I encountered during 30,000 kilometres I had two rear lower shock butchers fail within the same week while camping in Kosciuszko National Park due to the mechanic I paid to install them using the incorrect bushes. So I ended up having to get on my phone and was able to get enough signal to send out some emails back and forth to order some spare parts and have them posted to the near nearby post office where I went and collected them a few days later. I also had my gearbox main seal fail on the front after only 17,000 kilometres despite being them being completely rebuilt, which cost me another 2200 bucks to get Land Rover to fix it again for me. Which unfortunately, the transfer box still leaks even worse now. So I'll never win with that one. I had my turbocharger bearings fog out after only 30,000 kilometres, despite having that completely rebuilt. So there was another $2,000 down the drain. I think it may have been a, a poor rebuild job, as when I opened it up, I found a broken off nut, which would have sent everything out of alignment. After that, really the only issues were small mechanical or electrical issues, faulty earths and loose nuts, which I'd fix myself, typically after a daily pre-check before starting the car and starting off on the track. Now, how much does it cost to travel around Australia? Well, after 10 months and 304 days on the road, my total was around $24,655. Now, if I minus the major vehicle repairs for the Land Rover, which probably shouldn't have ever happened, it was $18,955. But if I remove all the Land Rover costs, such as maintenance and repairs, it comes to about $16,000 for 10 months for solo one-man travelling, which is about $1,600 per month or $52 per day. So start thinking about that if you're starting to get ideas for your own trip. But that is with no alcohol, soft drinks, junk food, and minimal takeaway. I was very self-sufficient and cooked most meals on my own. I gave up alcohol years ago, so it helps save money for traveling. Some of the specifications of my truck. I have 185 liters of diesel in the two tanks, the primary 120 liters and the secondary 65 liters. That gives me at Complete full load at three tonnes, eight kilometres per litre, giving me a 1,400 kilometre safe range. Safe in that I'd still have at least a good 10 litres plus swishing around in the bottom of the tanks. Unloaded, I get about 10 kilometres per litre. I carry 70 litres of water in three jerry cans, along with a five litre day-use can. So that way I can measure out each day my five litres and keep track of my consumption. I also have a lifesaver water bottle for filtering water from creeks and dams that I came across, which I did quite often, especially in some of the more pristine areas because the water was just delicious and I just preferred drinking out of a crystal clear creek. 
for electricity, I now have 440 watts of solar, and that powers 250 amp hours into the two batteries. For house use, which covers my fridge, oven, laptop, lights, and recharging camera batteries. Obviously, I, for those of you who know me, I run my own videos and, and editing while on the road, so that takes a lot more power to keep the laptop running and the video's camera batteries charged. I have my internal bed for sleeping, and UHF and HF radios, a spot tracker, and a personal locator beacon for communications. So some tips for traveling. I recommend downloading wiki camps and fuel maps on your smartphone. If for those who know, don't know wiki camps, it's an excellent app. It pay, you pay maybe like $10, $15 for it, and it has loads of free camps in it, as well as many caravan sites has up-to-date information from other people who have been there showing what the latest rates are, as well as reviews, so you know if it's something you should probably avoid. As some of the parks you visit will be absolutely crap holes that you don't want to go to. They probably should have been bulldozed in the 1970s. Some are just so unsafe. So that's a great idea. Plus, the fuel maps shows all the loca many locations of the fuel stops and what the latest pricing is. I also recommend you get yourself a massive map of Australia on your wall. Hema Maps does some really good wall maps and put lots of pins in all the places that you absolutely want to go. Now I recommend not over planning. I basically put pins in the maps and allowed everything else in between to unfold naturally. I didn't have a set date where I'd have to be when, I just drove and as you go, you meet people on the road, you can see signs the national parks you didn't know existed. You stop in to visit information centres and get new ideas. So I always had that option to head off I come to a spot such as on the, on the Murray River where I only intended to stay one night and ended up staying five just because it was so beautiful. This way I have no regrets about any of the places I've been. I don't feel like I need to go back again because oh, I wish I had stayed that extra week there. It doesn't exist. I spent the time I felt was right in each of the parks and then moved on. In the end I didn't complete the full lap. So if you do have a limited time and you absolutely must do it, then okay, you can, you can force yourself to do the, tri the trip. But 10 months was enough to do half a lap, excluding WA. Which brings me now to 2018, next year. And what's on my list is Western Australia. And from travelling around and talking to people, they'd say you need at least a year to explore WA properly. I also had the Simpson Desert, which I missed out on as it was coming into summer by the time I made it there. And when I hit Udandatta, they said they were forecasting 40 degree days. So I thought I'd give that a miss. So if you'd like to follow my 2018 <coughs> travels, or if you want to go back and look over all my blog posts and videos for my 2015 trip and earlier, you can follow me on roamingtheoutback.com, which is my travel blog. That's where I'll keep up a daily sort of update of what I'm doing. There's also my YouTube channel where I post my YouTube videos of the travels I've been over the years and I have 54 Land Rover Defender videos of the upgrades I've done on my truck as well as repairs and modifications. So if you have a night and you have nothing on, jump on the Defender playlist and sit there for a couple of hours and enjoy. Might give you some new ideas. If you really enjoy my, page, my uh, videos and would like to help support me, I have a Patreon page, which is, which is like a crowdfunding platform where you help donate maybe a dollar a month to help me stay on the road and keep the videos coming. So if you enjoy my videos, please consider becoming a patron. So are there any questions regarding my truck or my travels or my modifications?